Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining today, wherever you're joining from. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to announce that today our speaker is Professor Eleftherius Goliamakis. He is a Greek physicist and a university professor in the field of atom second physics, like a lot of us. And after graduating from the southernmost high school of Europe, he studied physics at the University of Crete, and he acquired his degrees in physics in 2000 and a master's degree in optoelectronics in 2022. He received his doctorate, doctorate in physics in 2005 from the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich with a thesis on the characterization of light waves using attosecond pulses. Later, he worked uh, as a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in Garsh in Germany. And from 2010 to 2018, he led the activities at the research group Atoelectronics at the same institute. And in 2010, he also took on an associate professorship at Postec in Korea, where he coordinated the Max Planck Center for Atosecond Research. Since 2018, Professor Golemakis has been the head of the research group Extreme Photonics at the University of Rostock. And he is best known for his work on attosecond physics, in particular, the first direct measurement of the field of light waves using the technique now known as attosecond streaking. And his group has been the first to realize optical attosecond pulses using light field synthesis and also to use this tool for studying ultrafast and strong field phenomena in atoms and solids. And for this work uh, on the other second control and synthesis of light waves, he has been awarded the Georgios Fotenos Prize of the Academy of Athens in 2007, the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics Young Scientist Prize in Optics of the International Commission for, Opti for Optics in 2009, and the Gustav Hertz Prize of the German Physical Society in 2013, and the Hontgen Prize of the Justus Liebig University of Kissen in 2015. So we're going to have a really nice talk today and we're happy that he accepted the invitation. So he will talk about attosecond physics with synthesized light transients. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for joining the Atto Fridays and thank you so much for accepting and supporting our initiative today. So we're ready to go. Uh, you may start and the floor is, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Carla and co-workers for, for uh, having me and for uh, taking all this effort to have this beautiful concept uh, set up and running uh, that allows the uh, convenient communication of, uh, of scientists around the globe. Uh, let's consider this to be a nice leftover, let's say of the Corona times that we are going to keep and communicate uh, science through this way. Now, what I will uh, talk about today, um, I will try to describe and I will try to introduce you to what um, synthesis of light can offer to attosecond physics. Atto Fridays is a meeting uh, that primarily addresses uh, although not exclusively, I guess, the attosecond community. And um, in contrast to most of presentations that are given nowadays on this topic and the tools that are being uh, usually um, employed, uh, here the emphasis will remain on visible light and what visible light can do. Now, synthesized light uh, implies uh, directly that one is interested to uh, um, um, okay, uh, one is interested to manipulate light, but certainly we are not the first to manipulate light. So what I want to say with this is that uh, the process of taming light and taming light in time is certainly not something new. 
what I want to say with this is that if we go back to the 50s, um, already temporal resolution um, uh, was um, attained by the use of ordinary light, uh, incoherent light coming from a lamp, uh, actually from a, uh, a flash lamp. And if you like to see it in a general way, you will recognize that even in a flashlight, uh, in a flash lamp um, that, that um, um, emits light within microseconds, if you like, um, you have already achieved a certain degree of control over light waves. And uh, practically, the degree of control is to more or less confine light within a, a corresponding time window and use it to measure um, in real time physical phenomena. But uh, the big, big breakthrough um, that followed was, of course, the invention of the laser in the 60s and for a number of decades um, allowed uh, the confinement of light on much shorter time scales. And if you take into account the development of pulse compressors and pulse shapers, the control of light was transferred from just simply confining light into a, a narrow time window that we had before to a precision control of the envelope, as we call it, of a light waveform or the frequency sweep, uh, the frequency um, sweep of uh, under the envelope of light. Yet another uh, revolution in the control of light uh, starts, if you like, from the new millennium uh, um, by the pioneering work primarily of Professor Hensch, uh, which is the capability to uh, enforce lasers, if you like, to provide pulses of light that they were field reproducible. So not only the spectral content, uh, between pulse to pulse that uh, are coming out from a laser is identical, but even the field waveform um, is uh, attained. And as you, most of you know, uh, this capability uh, has important implications, both in attosecond physics, but more generally in precision spectroscopy, and has been, uh, of course, the topic of a Nobel work. Now, if we follow this millennium and we are interested to say, what could possibly be now the next degree of control that we want to apply over light? Uh, what is next after having all those uh, possibilities? Well, certainly it will have to be something that uh, embodies all these capabilities, but it goes a step further. And the step further is exactly what you precisely see in this uh, um, cartoon here, will be the capability to shape the light with a precision that is related to the electric field itself. So no more a control over the envelope or the frequency sweep, but the control of the precise shape of the field waveform. And that implies that um, this is not something that uh, would just simply require any temporal control, it would require what we call attosecond control. And this is easily to infer because if you consider that the visible light has a carrier frequency uh, or a period of the visible light is around two femtoseconds, you understand that in order to sculpt something in time such that you are faster than two femtoseconds, you require more or less attosecond resolution. Now, we have not yet developed in physics uh, shapers um, that could undulate light in real time so that they can shape it in a way we want. Uh, for example, like in this cartoon. Um, actually, if we could, that would be already what we were searching for because the modulator would be actually as fast as we would wish to, uh, to have. But there is also another idea, and this is the idea of the so-called parallel modulation. So practically to sculpt light waves, you do not really chase the light waves in time and try to, to shape them, but rather you uh, synthesize them uh, by taking uh, light wave packets at different parts of the spectrum, as you see here in this cartoon, um, in the visible, um, in the near infrared, um, in the, in the uh, near UV and in the deep UV, and by putting them together and adjusting their relative phases, just as in any uh, typical experiment that you would do with electromagnetic waveforms in, uh, in an electricity lab, 
we can synthesize light um, with this precision. Now, of course, the concept is easier to, to describe than doing. And here I will tell you very, very briefly, because this is a technology that goes on for years, how can we do that? And as you can imagine, um, attaining this possibility is certainly not a single man show. Uh, it's something, it's a path um, that uh, my group and my team has been pursuing for uh, way more than a decade. As you can see here, uh, where several people have invested uh, time and effort uh, to go to and to achieve the basic goals. Um, you see uh, first generation people up to 2015, 16, and now we are entering the second generation um, that um, fine tunes further this possibility. And um, this is the people that were directly in my team, but I have had also in this path as a, an important co-worker, uh, Vladimir Pervak, uh, who has been um, and probably is one of the um, um, top experts in um, thin film technology nowadays, and his contributions on making light synthesis possible has been instrumental. But what do I mean with all these words here? Um, the key concept, uh, as I uh, alluded to earlier, is what we call multicolor uh, light field synthesis. And practically to do something that is multicolor, you need to have all those colors. But thanks to the laser, modern laser technology and nonlinear optics, we can now generate light uh, that spans um, something like a good part of a full petahertz in the visible part of the spectrum, as you can see in this graphic, starting from the infrared and going all the way to the UV. And of course, obviously, if you would like now to create and to uh, create wave packets at different colors, you will have to split this light into individual parts and then put them again together. Now, the technology that underlies this possibility uh, is shown uh, here, uh, the so-called light field synthesizer, a technology that has been developed up to a certain point until 2016. And the idea is to take here in the beginning of this uh, setup, for example, the, uh, I'm not sure whether I managed to uh, run the relevant animations uh, and why not? Uh, okay, no, I, I can't get it uh, on, although in the tests we were rather successful in doing it. Oh no, it works right now. Uh, so uh, we can uh, therefore divide this super continuum light um, in individual bands, as you can see different colors. And utilizing chirp mirror technology, we can uh, compress the pulses in each individual band down to only a few femtoseconds. And if uh, it's been considered challenging, even today in labs to have few cycle pulses available, please keep in mind that this technology here requires that you have very short light pulses, as you can see in these panels, not only in one and two, but in um, several um, parts of the spectrum, including the very challenging uh, part of the uh, ultraviolet. Now, um, how do we synthesize things? Well, the basic idea is to modify now the amplitude and the relative phase or the relative delay uh, between these bands. And in that way, uh, we can synthesize a waveform um, which we wish to synthesize. Now, of course, you will tell me, uh, how can you know what do you synthesize? And that implies that uh, an inherent um, capability that uh, has to be integrated actually in this technology is the possibility to measure. And this brings us back to uh, things that we did um, some 20 years back, namely um, the technique of attosequence streaking, uh, in which a attosequence uh, pulse uh, in the extreme ultraviolet is being used as a sampler of a light waveform. Now, this technique has been alluded to several times, I'm pretty sure in this meeting, 
Therefore, I would uh, spare an additional explanation so that we can focus on the most important parts. And here, what you see is uh, the synthesizer as, we, as I have shown this before. Typically what we do, we have a waveform in the beginning, um, which is the synthesis of all these individual bands, but we have absolutely no clue how these bands are put together and what kind of waveform do they create. So what we do in the beginning, we are using the technique of auto sequence streaking to perform a measurement of the waveform that is generated by the synthesizer. And we do the streaking uh, traces as you can see here. And from the streaking traces um, with very simple math without complicated reconstructions, we can derive the precise shape of the electric field. Uh, as you can see it here, both in field domain and intensity. Intensity is helpful to see how sharp the waveform will be in extreme nonlinear optics. And at the same time, now the uncertainty is lifted. We can actually see what are the relative phases of the individual bands if we have, of course, the complete waveform. And what we do in turn, we start commanding our synthesizer to adjust phases such as that it can create another waveform. A new measurement is being performed, a new analysis. And as you can see here, we can, for example, synthesize um, light fields where two dominant uh, spikes within only a few femtoseconds, very sharp spikes, are being created at a given delay, as you can see here. Uh, or we can go uh, further. Uh, again, this is a fully controllable uh, process to derive a light field waveform that if you see it in the field appears to be, well, strange. But if you see it here and, and in the time domain, you see that we have created a light waveform, which is very short. It has a, a, an attosecond fast ending uh, of the waveform. Now, for um, some applications that can be important, but as you probably guess by looking at these plots, the ultimate manifestation of the resolution that one can attain utilizing this kind of tools is of course the synthesis of an optical attosecond pulse. And here you see how this is done. Now you see that we are going to synthesize the waveform so that all the phases of the um, uh, waves are coming together. The streaking trace, uh, which we use to measure the waveform becomes very sharp. And you can see here how sharp the electric field is. And you can see also how extremely sharp um, this field looks like in the uh, time the intensity domain. So um, you see a ratio between consecutive half cycles, which is more than a factor of five. Um, and that allows you to understand, especially if you are coming from the field of extreme nonlinear optics, that practically such a waveform um, is going to interact with the system and give an isolated push, an isolated uh, strong um, interaction um, on the system that lasts only a few hundreds of attoseconds. Of course, some people um, are not familiar so much with um, um, recognizing and measuring light in the field domain. They prefer the so-called envelope. Well, field envelope is of course perfectly acceptable too. Here you can see that um, light is indeed confined on attosecond windows, no matter the definition. So this allows us to lift uh, a long-standing in my opinion, misunderstanding that the reason why we have gone to the XUV to create other second pulses is because we couldn't do it in the optical domain. That's not the reason. We have advantages in the XUV, but we can do it in the optical domain. And what is the big advantage? Well, as you can see here, these pulses are going to be very, very energetic. Actually, you can use them to do nonlinear optics right away. You don't have the concerns that you have in the XUV where the low photon count is an important uh, um, uh, problem that you need to overcome. And more importantly, you have light at precisely the frequencies where valence electrons are responding. Um, and this is something that you can possibly do for some specific cases in the extreme ultraviolet, but in most of the cases you can't. And that is an important competency that that's uh, this kind of pulses bring in. Now, if we wanted to uh, place this kind of efforts on a generic chart that uh, describes the progress 
of um, um, humans, of scientists actually to dominate light, to tame light. Uh, starting of course from the era of the laser, we won't go now too far in. Um, you will recognize of course the, the extremely uh, fast uh, improvement and shortening of pulses down to um, on the order, a few femtoseconds in the um, 80s. And then you will recognize the famous plateau. The technology could not move forward uh, for whichever reasons. And at around 2000, we have a rapid drop, um, which allows us to cross for the first time the attosecond domain, um, the one femtosecond domain and enter the um, a sub femtosecond domain. This is the so called extreme ultraviolet route. And this is the route that uh, primarily has dominated in the previous decay, uh, decade attosecond physics. The light field synthesis that I have presented to you today represents the other route, the optical route, which allows us to reclaim, if you like, the attosecond domain with optical attosecond pulses which are going to bring a completely new range uh, of possibilities, at least that's what we hope, in understanding uh, fundamental and ultra-fast processes in matter. For many years, this uh, technology has been a privilege uh, of, of uh, our group. Uh, it's not anymore. Um, with a um, excellent co collaboration with ultra-fast innovations and help from the um, European Research Council. Council, we have been able to commercialize this technology. So in principle, uh, every scientist that wish to extend uh, its temp uh, his temporal, her temporal resolution um, utilizing lasers, the technology is now broadly available. Ever since the time that we uh, developed uh, this technology, uh, we uh, have not stop using it. So with synthesized light, we have been now able to explore different regimes of ultrafast and strong field physics. For example, already um, from the first years, we focused on the use of these pulses that you see them as a cartoon again here to measure the response of valence electrons, how coherences are created, how they evolve in real time. And last but not least, how long does it take a valence electron to respond to a very, very fast um, external um, um, uh, impulsive excitation uh, created by these pulses. But then we moved on to contribute with these pulses on the basic understanding of high harmonic generation in solids and to um, provide information related to the debate and the physical mechanisms that are really involved um, in this process. We have um, done experiments where we have used the ultrafine resolution of these pulses to see how quickly electrons after an excitation in a solid lose their coherence. We have moved on to do experiments um, where the light fields um, synthesized with this kind of um, uh, technology can uh, drive electronic motion in solids and allow us in this way by looking at the high harmonic emission to resolve also spatial information, um, angstrom scale um, information of solids. But more than this, uh, more recently um, is the possibility to explore attosecond nano-optics with this technology as a basic tool, or currently the research group is focusing attention, utilizing again this technology towards the understanding of phase transitions in solid state. Now, of course, I don't have the time um, to discuss about all these topics. And of course, a number of them uh, are already published. And many of you probably know some of this work. Therefore, in this uh, seminar, I'm going to focus now my attention on two topics uh, that I believe um, are fitting the best uh, the uh, scope of this uh, meeting and of this um, um, uh, seminar. And these are these two that you see here. The first uh, that I will be talking about is 
how can we use these tools uh, together with XUV atosequent pulses to see how long does it take the excitation of an electron in a solid to completely deface, to completely lose its coherence? Uh, what are the limits? How fast can we go and measure that kind of properties in solids? And the second topic, uh, as I uh, uh, alluded to before, will be how these pulses can allow us to cross another frontier, and namely the possibility to create a new tool in attosecond physics, namely attosecond electron pulses. These are therefore the two topics, uh, which I hope um, will be interesting to you. Uh, let's start with the first, probing electronic decoherence or probing how coherence is going away um, in a solid after excitation. Let me first remind you something that uh, even if you are not coming from solid state physics, you have heard this way or the other. And namely, what is the simplest possible picture that relates to excitons in solids, right? Usually you have a valence and conduction band, typically of the order of uh, electron volts. That means with a, an optical pulse, what can you do? You can pull an electron from the valence band up to the conduction band. That means that you're going to create an excitation, um, what we call an exciton, which is the most fundamental excitation in solid state physics. The formation of an electron and a hole that are held by attractive forces. And of course, attractive forces be between positive and uh, negative charge isolated uh, implies the formation of states uh, that are typically uh, created and are being studied extensively in exciton physics today. <clears throat> you can easily recognize excitons because uh, although you're typically getting most of the time a continuum uh, spectra from solids, you would recognize after the excitation that uh, quasi discrete uh, spectra are, um, are appearing um, in your measurement, which implies that actually uh, they represent more or less the states that you see here. Now, this is a typical concept, well recognized. Now, of course, comes a second question. Think that we have a semiconductor and an insulator, but we don't have an optical pulse, but we do have an XUV pulse, X-ray radiation. Now, X-ray radiation will uh, have a preference here um, because of the cross-sections, which are, of course, much higher when electrons interact with X-rays, um, core electrons uh, interact with X-rays. I'm going to primarily have a core excitation. The electron is not going to be removed from the valence band from the core level, but from a core level. And in this case, in principle, I'm supposed also again to create an exciton, right? And many of you uh, would probably argue, yeah, that's what we call a core exciton. Sure. The point is, how do we know that this is a core exciton? Is this something um, really the case? Is this something really proven? And exactly um, this question has uh, been a debate which actually lasted uh, for many years. Um, I would say it was um, a discussion that was going on for a couple of decades. And people were asking, does this create a, a core hole, um, um, uh, exciton between the excited electron and the core hole, or it doesn't? Is this obvious? In fact, if you try to look at the spectra, for example, here you see um, Electro, um, um, absorption spectra of solids uh, like silicon carbide, silicon dioxide, silicon uh, nearby the silicon edge, you will recognize that it's very unlikely to believe that this continuum structure here gives you the obvious um, answer to the question. Um, remember I said in the previous slide that a discrete spectrum is talking about an exciton, but here, it's not clear at all, and it hasn't been clear at all. So some people uh, would argue that, and here you see some of the papers of the time. So you see we are talking about uh, 20 years back. Um, some people would say, well, that edges that we see here is the exciton, probably nearby the conduction bad edge. Some others would say, 
We can simply reproduce theoretically this spectra without the need to consider anything like an exciton. And that debate um, went on for a few years. It was never solved. And you know, after a certain point, the discussion stopped. The tools are not uh, available. Now, we shouldn't blame at all our, um, uh, our theory colleagues uh, that um, were not able at that time, just by looking such kind of data from experimentalists to resolve that um, um, riddle here, because probably the experimentalists at that time were not able to fully do their homework. If the spectral domain study, the time integrated study can do the job, you need to go to the time domain. But how do you go to the time domain? Can you see excitons also in the time domain? The answer is actually positive. So how people do that in optical um, regime first so that we understand the concept. Usually we have an optical excitation. Uh, we bring the electron up and this creates of course the corresponding um, discrete structure. And what people do they are driving then the excited system with a half cycle pulse, typically in the terahertz to match the energy uh, bandwidth of the exciton. And what do they observe? They observe two basic phenomena, which are characteristic phenomena of excitons. The so-called exciton bleaching, which is nothing that if you follow the excitonic line, you see the amplitude being uh, distorted. Um, and you see also the so-called uh, Stark effect. If it's an atomic-like system, we all know, at least the people from the atomic physics, that in the presence of the field, um, the um, uh, lines are being distorted, which means that uh, a Stark effect is appearing. Now, if they would do these experiments in a time-resolved fashion, um, the, the response that they would see in different lines would look like this for the exital bleaching at a specific time that the two overlap, we would see a weakening, and at the time, in the case that the Stark shift is existing, which again indicates an exciton, they would see a shift um, of the resonance. But typically people do that in the absorption spectrum and in the absorption spectrum, they record uh, transient um, uh, traces that look like this. Now let's um, name these things that I have just reminded you uh, or um, from, from ordinary ultrafast um, spectroscopy as ultrafast exciton markers, right? Um, what these markers again indicate here is a shift uh, in the delay and a, a change in the absorption. These are things that people would um, use in order to recognize the presence of an exciton. Now let's say that we wanted to do the same experiment, but with X-ray excitation of matter. Now things are getting different. The first step would be with a core excitation, right? Now, how short should this excitation be? Is this something arbitrary or is this something we can think in advance? Well, in fact, if you look how the um, synchrotron data look for the silicon edge, you would see that uh, you are talking about widths that are on the order of electron volts. That means that if you want to be safe, you will have to use a probe in time, which is faster than an inverse electron volt. So in reality, it tells you that we need to have an attosecond soft X-ray excitation. So you need an XUV attosecond pulse. All right, um, that's a tool that we have. And we had that also several years back. So that's not the point. Now, however, the second point is if we excite uh, this system and we want to probe it, what do we need to apply here, right? We need something whose bandwidth is comparable again here to the width of the system that we probe. Again, electron volts. So practically the optical probe in this case has again to be at a second if we want to use the first resolution. So you need also an at a second optical probe. You need an optical half cycle pulse for the same reason that you need it earlier, a terahertz half cycle pulse. And actually this is precisely what uh, I'm promising you and what we are going to do uh, right now here. I remind you here uh, the basic idea that I discussed before. So as a reminder, how do we recognize excitons 
in the optical domain. And let's try to do an XUV experiment. We have here uh, an XUV at the second pulse and an optical at the second pulse together. They are going to um, interact with a thin SiO2 film. And then I'm measuring with a spectrometer the XUV light as a function of the delay between the two. Um, I recognize uh, here in the XUV spectrum from 100 to 100 electron volts, uh, spectral uh, patterns that have been already recognized, of course, in spectroscopy. But then I trace them in real time by varying the delay between the optical at the second pulse and the XUV at the second pulse. And what do we see here? Well, precisely the things that I have been promising you. We see that the exciton B around the middle area undergoes a, a softening, a bleaching, if you like, while the exciton lines at A and A prime undergo a start shift. So precisely this characteristic that is being used in optical domain to recognize excitons, now, thanks to this technology, extends, and we can recognize that indeed we are forming excitons here. This is also the uh, differential spectrum that uh, we experimentalists prefer to look at. And what you would recognize here that even without any advanced analysis uh, of the data, um, these arrows here show you that whatever happens here is unbelievably fast. So the phenomenon that we are creating there goes and disappears on a very, very short time scale. Um, around one femtosecond, the B exciton nearby the conduction band, and at around three femtoseconds only, the A and A prime excitons um, of the system. Now, let me tell you that uh, silicon, um, the silicon edge, if you try to do a, an atomic experiment, you will end up with a lifetime of silicon, which is only on the order of <clears throat> 20 femtoseconds or longer. That indicates that this dephasing process that we see here, the start and disappearance of the coherence, has absolutely nothing to do with the lifetime of the core core. Or in other words, there is something much faster in the environment of the excited electron that pushes this electron and pushes this um, coherence to die extremely fast. I will not go into details regarding this, but what I wanted to tell you is that because we know precisely the electric field that is being used, we can analyze also the physics and we can uh, reach more detailed conclusions other than the rough conclusions that I have just given. We can fit, if you like, <coughs> the decay of the dipoles that are being excited um, with our X-ray pulse and we can model the way that our half cycle is actually uh, changing. the um, pushes this exciton to, um, to deface extremely fast. And by doing that kind of reconstructions and details uh, I'm not going to do here, you see how well uh, we can reconstruct with that simple decay model uh, the process. We can conclude um, actually for the first time the detailed time that core hole excitations take place. And you can recognize this better here on this panel. You see that uh, all of these exciton states have another dephasing time. Um, these two states here, uh, or excitons decay on the order of two to three femtoseconds, but this broadband exciton um, that we see here does have a decay time too, and actually dies on a sub femtosecond time scale. So as you see here, about uh, 750 attoseconds, it takes um, this coherence to decay after the excitation. So you understand that the only way that you can learn something about these states is to be able to time resolve them. And actually uh, here on this table, which I'm not of course uh, detailing here, but what I want to certainly comment is that we can, um, other than the relaxation uh, time, we can um, learn information about the polarizability of these transient states, how fast um, they bleach under the field, uh, the bleaching parameters, and how much is the uh, coupling between the excited states and the uh, LO uh, phonon uh, of the crystal that we use. 
We can also derive uh, spatial information because why? Because we know from atomic physics, and this applies also in excitons, that uh, if I know the polarizability A of a system, then, and the dielectric constant of this system, I can calculate more or less the size of this uh, exciton, how big it is. We have done this um, utilizing our data, and we have uh, seen that uh, the B exciton, it's of course, very confined, very tiny. It's, a, it's more core than the other. It's about 1.3 Bohr radii, uh, while the A uh, prime excitons are much bigger by a factor of two, uh, 2.4 uh, Bohr radii. And here you see the comparison with theory. Um, actually, that shows that um, temporal resolution properly applied and with basic uh, ideas of um, um, optics allows us to attain also spatial information in conquering these kind of systems. Now, these ideas can be extended uh, even in uh, free electron lasers, if you like, uh, because there the goal would be to um, utilize them in conjunction with uh, free electron um, uh, electron um, uh, X-ray uh, pulses on a film, and you can use them, you can use the laser field as a switch, if you like, so that you can turn on and off the transmission of a medium. This will allow you eventually the possibility to create precisely synchronized uh, optical uh, attosecond pulses and hard X-ray attosecond pulses. You will have, of course, to move to resonances uh, far in the X-ray regime to have this useful, but it should be possible. That's uh, about the area that we just discussed. And now I will say a few words on a completely new topic, um, unpublished, but to be published in the, in the, um, within the month, uh, strong field nano-optics. And this is a topic that a lot of people have discussed before. So here the key interest um, is about the possibility to use laser pulses uh, to emit electrons from nanotips. And we are not, of course, the first to do such an experiment. There is a number of citations of prominent papers here. But the questions that um, we wanted to address by doing experiments uh, here is, is the physics that is related to a strong field interaction here, single electron, multi-electron physics? Is the emission of electrons on an attosecond time scale or not? Can I time resolve the emission of electrons? And does this idea of fair potential for novel sources of ultrafast spectroscopy and microscopy? This is the key point uh, behind our research. And we know um, a lot of tools, and I'm pretty sure these kind of tools have been many times alluded in this meeting, how to generate and study electron pulses in atoms, right? We just shine atoms. And we uh, accept now generally that the three-step model is the right model to describe the formation of an electron wave packet, which upon recollision with an atom, as you can see here, creates, of course, an electron pulse, which recollides with the atom and emits radiation. And here we have a lot of uh, tricks to learn something about this electron pulse because we are typically looking at the high harmonics that are being emitted. So for atoms, we can learn about electron physics here without really doing something very particular other than the things that we already do in attosecond physics. Um, now, if we think, however, of the same phenomenon being extended in a metal, in a nanotip, right? We have the laser is going to emit electrons. And the question is, probably this is again the dominant process, if it is, right? Um, is going to create, again, a rescatter electron pulse. Um, and that would be actually, in principle, if we believe the basic ideas of the three-step model, will also be an attosecond electron pulse, which I can use to do a beautiful range of things, such as electron diffraction right away here, or I can learn something about the dynamics of plasmons and correlated systems. The problem that I have here with this electron pulse is that I can't measure it with X-rays because they are not generated. So at least to the best of our knowledge, uh, knowledge soft X-ray emission is not occurring, at least not efficiently uh, when we have 
uh, strong field interactions with nanotubes. Therefore, we need to find another way. And another way is to look at things directly in the field emission, directly on the electron spectrum. We did such an experiment and we used, of course, the tools that I have introduced before. We shown our short pulses on tungsten nanotips. You know, tungsten has a work function of around 4.5. We used our um, very short pulses, actually somewhat longer single cycle pulses. And we wanted first to see, is this a field emission as we know it in atoms tunneling, we call it in atoms, or is it just multiphoto? And we did that quickly by measuring the electron yield versus the intensity of the uh, very short pulse here. And if we evaluate the slope of this data, uh, you can immediately conclude that the slope indicates a nonlinearity much lower than the multiphoton nonlinearity. So one can assert here that we are safely in the tunneling regime. But then what? Let's see how the photoelectron spectra look like from that kind of system. So here, for example, you see the uh, electron uh, spectrometer, uh, electrons are emitted, and then I'm recording them by varying continuously the field. And you see beautiful spectra, I remind you these ones that we record in atoms, but also note that they go to extremely high energies compared to what we usually do. Here you see them in a false color, and actually you can use um, uh, this data to recognize that you have actually two cutoffs. Um, the one could possibly be associated, this one with uh, what we call direct emission, and this one will be probably associated with what we call rescattered emission. Now the question is, are they really like this? Just because I have two uh, lines, this doesn't tell me much. But in fact, if you take the slope, the energy variations version, uh, versus, versus UP, you will instantly recognize that the ratio between the two is about 4.91, which is very close to the known five, 10 UP divided by two UP that we know in atomic physics. So that allows us immediately to conclude that yes, things go well. Uh, we do have similar physics to that of atoms. Now taking a step further and doing exactly the same experiment with exactly the same pulse with uh, neon atoms um, and compare now the slope of neon and the slope that we measured with uh, the tungsten nanotip, we can measure directly the so-called field enhancement factor, which is the effect that nearby um, the area of a nanometer shaped, uh, a nanometer sized object, much smaller than the wavelength of light, I expect that the field is going to be enhanced. And indeed we derive something very reasonable if you compare uh, the, this number of about field enhancement of about 3.5 compared to what theory usually predicts is around this number. Now, uh, this doesn't tell us that the pulses are short just because I measured the spectrum. We need something to do. And that's what we call homochromatic attosecond streak. What we do, we are going to use uh, a, an optical pulse, an optical pulse like these ones we described before, and a very weak replica of this pulse to time resolve the emission. Is this possible? Let's see how this would work. Think that you have, this is the strong light pulse, right? What do you know from basic atomic physics is that an electron is generated near the peak of a field, recollight sometime later, and of course, this is going to create a very short electron pulse. How short, we do not know. Let's say for the moment, it's going to be at a second for the sake of clarity. And after the recollision, of course, the electron is going to um, evolve its energy uh, further. Um, we are going to have direct and uh, uh, rescattered or backscattered electrons that will end up to a specific final energy. Now, let's say that we use an extremely weak field that we call the probe field. Now, this field is going to be so weak that can only modify the momentum of the previously released electrons, but it cannot by no means induce ionization. What's going to happen is that the electrons that are being generated at this moment of time 
are going to be up strict and down strict depending on the delay between the two. If I calculate theoretically this basic idea using a simple uh, Levenstein um, Ivanov model, then I'm going to get a trace like this, which reminds you quite a lot the famous streaking spectrograms that we get with soft X-rays. So we see here a trace forming in the cutoff, which is uh, directly related to the um, probe pulse that I have used, the very weak pulse that we have here. Now, think also of the following without, um, I'm going to, to be a little bit fast on the math because you will have the possibility to read the paper very soon. The basic idea how to measure now the duration is to recognize that a, a wave packet that is being generated here in time, in the presence of it, the field that generated is going to have a specific uh, a, a momentum uh, distribution. And this is something that we can uh, describe mathematically through the Levenstein Ivanov model, which is around, of course, for many years. Um, the second thing that we will have to think is that uh, the electron after the recollision is going to get a specific additional momentum before it reaches our detector. And we call this the terminal spectral amplitude. Again, this is something that we know uh, to write mathematically uh, through that basic important theory in second physics. Now, if I put a weak replica and do the math, uh, uh, what I'm saying here is to add the weak field, that what is going to happen is that the weak replica is going to actually undulate uh, the uh, final kinetic energy of my electrons uh, up and down. And we can show mathematically, and I'm not doing that now explicitly here, that this is going to be uh, having the form of what we call a frog trace. And that kind of frog trace, I'm giving you some theoretical examples here, um, will embody information about the chirp of the electron pulse at the moment of its own recollision. So here you see, for example, different kind of chirps uh, that a theoretical pulse is going to have and how this is going to be shown in the spectrogram. Uh, those that come from attosequence streaking would recognize the, um, the relevance between the classical attosequence streaking and this picture. Now, we went to the uh, lab and we did this experiment. Here you see some of the experimental details, inner and outer mirror, two pulses. The first pulse uh, releases electrons, a second pulse comes out of, uh, with a delay. And here you see electron spectra recorded, and you see here a first fulfillment, if you like, of my promise, that the photoelectron spectra will look uh, streaking like, and they are going to have an undulation here, from which I have argued before, and which is similar to attosequence streaking, um, that the vector potential of my uh, field could be reconstructed. And this reconstruction is actually this red line that you see here. Now, of course, for a new technique, you always have to compare with an old technique. And here um, we did exactly in the same setup ordinary at the second streaking. And we have concluded actually that um, it is uh, possible to compare the conventional streaking AG and AF um, together, as you see here, and this comparison shows a great fidelity, um, a great agreement between the two, which makes us confident that things go well and that this is also a, a new technique of value that allows us to take the next step towards the characterization of a nanosecond electron pulse. And here you see the uh, real amplitude comparisons between the two vectors potentials, which measures again the field enhancement in the direct time domain methodology. Now, um, how do we reconstruct this? The reconstruction is something similar compared to what we do in ordinary at the second streaking. We are focusing our attention on the top part of this spectrogram. Why? Because we are interested in electron pulses of high energy. And we can use the mathematical formulation that we have developed. Um, and through that mathematical formulation, and by recognizing the fact that in the end of the, of the uh, interaction, the wave packet, which can, we can directly characterize, and the original wave packet are related through the Volkov propagation, 
we can characterize practically our autosecond electron pulse. This is shown a little bit better here. You see here experiment, and you see here reconstruction of the two. Uh, here you see the um, pulse um, at the end of the interaction, what we call the terminal electron wave packet. And here you see the reconstructed electron pulse at the moment the wave packet is returning to the tip. And we have characterized and we have seen that in that, with that methodology, we can probe for the first time um, the duration of attosecond electron pulses in real time with this new methodology. And we can compare actually, uh, the technique doesn't allow us only this, allows us to get a lot of details uh, of both pulses, the electron pulse and the optical field and how they are synchronized. And here you will recognize that just as in atomic physics, the emission of the electron pulse occurs very close to the zero transition of the light field. Shows that we have a very, very strong relevance between strong field atomic physics and the atomic physics of metals under extremely strong fields. And here you see also what we call the time frequency analysis of the uh, electron pulse. This allows us to take a, a closer look to the chirp. And if we compare the chirp, uh, the group delay practically of our pulse uh, versus time and a theoretical semi-classical prediction using the Levenstein model, you see that there is a very, very reasonable uh, agreement indicating that indeed many of the concepts that we have developed in atomic physics, we can now easily transport them to the study of attosequent phenomena with electron pulses in solids. All right, what is next then? What we can do with these pulses? Well, that's um, something, uh, there is something we can do right away. Now here we had only a tungsten nanotip, but you can imagine that exactly that place, just as a coating or as a uh, attachment, you can place plasmonic systems, quantum dots, correlated materials. And then you can study carefully the phase of the emitted electron pulses and you will be able to resolve through this way um, the attosecond phase of the emission and therewith, of course, to uh, resolve uh, attosecond phenomena on metal surfaces, on nanotips, um, allowing you practically to connect now nano-optics and attosecond physics within one methodology. We are, of course, more ambitious and we believe that the same technique will allow us also to do attosecond diffraction. Attosecond diffraction, of course, the pulse comes back uh, after the generation, but it's not just a pulse, right? It's an electron pulse with high energy. So the pulses that we have created here have a carrier energy of around 20 to 50 electron volts, which is pretty much the energy range where low energy electron um, uh, diffraction works. So in principle, we shall be able to combine now by using this uh, methodology at a second, um, resolution in time and possibly angstrom or picomaker resolution in space utilizing these technologies. I'm going back to the last, uh, the first slide, uh, which is also, of course, the concluding uh, slide. And I hope that within this presentation, I have convinced you that um, there is a great range of possibilities um, of fundamental phenomena, both in atoms and in solids that we can explore utilize synthesized light. And through that, I'm also inviting you to join us in this path, both experimentalists. This technology is now generally available, but also theorists. Uh, take advantage, ask us to uh, give you precisely how the modern optical fields look like so that you can make calculations and make predictions of beautiful, beautiful phenomena that we can afterwards as a community explore and learn new things about electrons and attosecond physics. Nothing of this work would have been possible without uh, the competent teams. Um, here you see my current team and the alumni that have contributed over the years for making um, some of this work uh, possible. Uh, for the project, the last project that I mentioned, I would also like to uh, thank uh, my local colleagues here, Thomas Fennell and Leonard Seifert, for their great uh, contributions um, on the side of theory. And of course, uh, I would like to thank you once again for the invitation. 
and thank all of you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, really nice talk. It's really impressive to see what we can do nowadays uh, with uh, lights and to shape and th synthesize light. Now, are the questions, comments? I can see some of them are coming. So before we start with the questions, I would like to make one announcement, namely that uh, we are already starting to invite people for the Quantum Battles in Atom Science 2023. It's going to be in London from the 28th to the 30th of uh, June. And uh, we're hoping for a good tournament. We're going to stream parts of it. We don't know yet how many, but I don't want us to go back to the 20th century. So we'll continue doing out of Fridays as long as we can, probably until next spring. And then uh, back uh, towards uh, the autumn. And uh, I hope everybody will have the chance to join and enjoy. So uh, the first question here is from Constantino Scotsis. Could you please add a few words on the localization of excitons, whether this feature can be unambiguously measured today? And if localized exciton states are likely to exist in many materials, and if it's dependent on temperature, pressure, et cetera, or environmental effects such as solvents? Yeah, thank you. Very interesting question. Yes, these uh, excitons uh, are Frenkel excitons. They are extremely localized. How do we know this? We know it because the, uh, the core, uh, the, the hole itself is localized. So um, there is a difference, of course, with the um, standard excitons that we have in uh, um, more standard or um, optical um, excitonic physics because here the exciton um, has a hole, which is a part of the core of electrons of the silicon atom. That one can't really move. It's very, very much localized. And that gives it also an important advantage of uh, being a probe uh, of very local uh, properties of materials. As it's going to stay there and um, allows you to have access to the physics around the, the edge. Regarding the parameters that you mentioned, um, there is no doubt that uh, external parameters such as pressure, of course, temperature and more and chemical environment are going to affect it. However, not exactly the way we are used to, right? Here we are talking about excitons that the binding energies are several electron volts, right? So with temperature, you would need to, to, to change the temperature or the pressure dramatically so that you, you can see a, a significant change. Now, when it comes to chemistry though, I mean, if you change the chemical environment, of course, the corresponding local forces will be much more dramatic uh, in comparison to, of course, an external force that you apply by hand. There, I believe that this will provide you additional sensitivity. And I wouldn't be surprised actually if the way that you are shaping the environment of uh, the exciton, you may be able to recognize differences that will be related, that will be imprinted even in the dephasing time. So exactly the way that orbitals are aligned around silicon and interact with the excited electron will play a role on how fast this exciton is going to decay. Is that fine? Would you like to, to, to ask further? Or is that fine with you? We have allowed you to speak. So if you would like to uh, ask, do feel free. Uh, and we also have a question here from Andre Stauti. How is homochromatic attoseconds tricking different from tiptoe? Um, what is tiptoe? I will, I will let him speak in just one second. Okay, Andre, you can speak now. So feel free to unmute yourself. We're still wondering about tip toe. All right, can you hear me now? Okay. Right. Yeah, Andre, I can hear you, yes. Hi, uh, nice talk, Elefterios. Um, Thank you. First, uh, of course. 
Uh, Tiptoe is this technique that was um, uh, developed by Kyung Tae Kim um, mm -hmm. from uh, from Korea, right? Uh, so there they have uh, they also have this method of streaking, um, not streaking. They're modifying the ionization probability um, mm -hmm. with a 400 nanometer pulse, I think I remember. So basically, it's the same setup as what you're doing, um, but uh, they have a very weak field that is. Uh, Add it to the field that you want to sample, and you're just changing the ionization probability a little bit. Yes. Uh, uh, oh, all right, all right. I see. Yeah, uh, um, I agree. Now I know what are you what you are talking about, Andre. Uh, look, uh, that's not the point here. The point here is not to sample the electric field. The point here is to sample the electron pulse. So we are. We are interested also in the electric field, but honestly, we can do it with auto sequence streaking and with absolute units, right? Okay. Uh, so we couldn't improve much in that direction. Our goal here is to develop a methodology that measures the electron pulse itself. Okay. And I think that's the asset that we contribute here. How can this combination of a weak and a strong field, which is in fact, quite generic. I mean, it goes back also to the beginning of the, uh, of the previous decade with, where also in Ottawa, I think uh, Kim was also involved there. Um, they did it, for example, by observing the displacement of the high harmonics or in solids uh, where uh, Ferenc and co-workers did the weak uh, and um, optical and the weak uh, and the strong optical on a solid to measure the light waveform. But okay. that's not our goal. Our goal is, once again, to measure the, the waveform of the electron pulse, the phase right. of the electron emission, which is, of course, the key ingredient of using this electron pulse in turn to do a two-second spectroscopy of electrons. Thank you. OK, uh, we also have a question from Omar Yagafur. Hi, I was wondering why and if you are limited to working with a nanotip, would the waveform driven electron diffraction work from just flat surfaces? Second question, can you couple the nanotip emission to an R piece to solve, uh, to resolve the angular pattern? Is that the method you would use to measure electron diffraction patterns? And finally, on a similar theme, could you do a two-color experiment where a UV, VUV pulse created a photoelectron wave packet that you then drive back to diffract from the material? Quite a lot of questions. So I, I love I love all of them. Thank you very much. The only problem is that I forgot the first. Can you repeat, uh, Carla? Can you repeat the first? Only the first. The other two I remembered. Uh, the first, why? Are you limited to work? Oh, all right, yes, yes, that's right. Yes, um, you are not limited, but I will tell you where, what is the point. The point is um, that if you really want to do, and that's actually a difference compared to the experiments done before with TIPS. We didn't have an interest just to show that electrons come out or that they are very short. We had an interest to drive these electrons at energies that when they recollide with a, with a metal, they have sufficiently high kinetic energy to diffract. You can't diffract any energy. If you have two, three electron volts at the moment of the recollision, they, the electron penetrates in, right? If you really want to probe layers, you will have to go to the energy spectrum of um, um, at least low energy electron diffraction. Now you will tell me why is this related? It is related for the following reason you will have to use therefore a very strong field, right? And the very strong field is going to create many electrons and we do have many electrons, but many electrons create space charge. Now the tip here has a huge advantage because the electrons are emitted radially with respect to the direction of the tip and, they, and the forces among these electrons are very, very quickly diminishing. And that gives you a huge advantage compared to a surface. Now, the other thing is, if you really want to do it on a surface, can't you really do it on the tip? I mean, 
Today, people can attach nearly anything on a tip, uh, even, even correlated materials, even quantum dots. So practically, it should be also possible to do it this way. I'm going to your second point, uh, which is uh, regarding the, um, the possibility of using a photoelectron, a, a, an ARPA setup. It's a beautiful idea. It's a beautiful idea. Uh, it will give more, more possibilities because then you are going to be able to resolve and to isolate features of your interest at different angles and so on. Uh, so, yes, we do have this equipment, we plan to go for it, but for the first diffraction experiments, we are considering to uh, stay with an ordinary detector placed um, in the far field. So we try to see whether we see discrete patterns coming directly from the system. The VUV um, concept that you are saying is also interesting. But I don't see it bringing us too much in the sense that if we go to UV, then we are going to bring more damage to the system. Of course, that's the one thing. And the second, um, the, um, the acceleration is practically given uh, by, the, uh, by the field itself. So you would prefer to use the same field. So it's just technically more convenient. So maybe you have some concept in mind that uh, would involve this too, and I would be more than Glad to discuss it further, but I mean, as a first look, I wouldn't see an obvious big advantage. Is that okay? Would you like to pursue it further? I have allowed you to speak, so in case you would like to, ah, thank you. Uh, so it seems fine, but in case you would like to, to talk and say hello and ask further, um, no more questions. Okay, no problem. No need to be sorry. We're here to discuss and you had very, th very good three questions. So we are fine, right? And if you are a bit shy hanging there, you are going to have the chance to ask questions uh, when we are outside YouTube. So we have a few people watching. So I thank you all once more so much for coming here live to the talk and supporting our speaker. And I also thank Professor Ngoliamakis for this very nice talk. And, and